So tonight we are uh, going to be looking at memory and what memory is all about. Now, um, in a lot of ways, um, memory really is at the core of, of what makes us who we are. Um, you know, imagine not being able to, you know, remember day to day who you are or what happened. I mean, that would be tough. Uh, a lot of science fiction kinds of shows are, are based on, on problems with memory. But tonight we're going to be talking about a little bit of the, the neuroscience of memory as well as um, memory psychologically what that means, the nature of it. Does anyone want to share what is your earliest memory from childhood? Anybody want to share that? I think mine was taking my survival swimming test. Um, I guess I was about three. So I just remember like laying in the pool and being scared. <laughs> Survival swimming test. Wow. About how old do you think you were? I think I was like three. Three. Okay. My proximate guess. <clears throat> Anyone else want to share? That's a great memory, by the way. Anybody else want to share an early memory? Um, well, believe it or not, uh, that is actually kind of a trick question. It's a, uh, it's really a psychologically uh, projective question because the truth is we really don't know. You probably don't know what your earliest memory actually is. When you ask someone, what is your earliest memory? They will tell you something a lot like how Catherine told us, but it tells us more about their personality organization than it does about their actual memory formation. Um, so, um, so Catherine is somebody who I would say, even though I don't really know you, I would say that she is someone who has persevered against a lot of obstacles and has, uh, learned how to survive in her life. That's been the kind of the hallmark of what's been going on with her. And maybe that's why, you know, you organize that as your earliest memory, because that's been sort of the theme of, of your life in some way. And, uh, you know, that's, and that, that's very interesting. Uh, memory is something too with human beings that is, it's not like a computer. You know how you will save something in a digital format on the computer. As long as that series of that binary code of zeros and ones is interrupted, um, then that particular file will remain exactly the way it is forever for as long as as the code remains intact human memory is very different from that in that we tend to add to our memories subtract our, from our memories we tend to take our memories and rehearse them if they're important to us we will share memories with people uh, and then sometimes we will have a discrepancy in what we remember. And then someone that we shared a memory with may help fill in the blanks to that memory or may even introduce false information and help us to create a false memory uh, out of uh, a sh even a shared event. Uh, and tonight we're gonna think about how all that, that works as well. So some of the basic memory processes we have here is, one is encoding. Encoding is just is is the act of laying down a memory into storage, and um, we have figured out that for the most part, the way our brain organizes memory is into three distinct uh, kinds of components. You have immediate memory, you have short-term memory, and you have long-term memory. Immediate memory is uh, here's my telephone number five four seven three zero seven two. And you say, you start rehearsing it in your brain, 547-3072, and you, maybe you'll run over and you'll write it down. And then once you have written it down, you let it go. 
And unless you've really, really rehearsed it over and over and over, eventually that memory will let go. And, and usually if it's not laid down into your short-term memory, uh, you'll let it go within seconds. Um, if it gets laid down into your short-term memory, then you'll retain it anywhere between um, seven and 12 minutes, sometimes less. And then of course, long-term memory is more of a permanent uh, sort of memory. So um, there are different kinds of uh, encoding in our, for our memories. And, and in, ac in actuality, all of your senses encode for memory. You know, you may have a memory of a specific smell even. So that would be an, an olfactory coding of, of memory. Uh, you know, for me, like one of my smells of childhood is honeysuckle because I grew up out in the country and anytime I smell honeysuckle or anything re remote, remotely like that, it reminds me of running around outside and barefoot and playing in the sprinkler and smelling the honeysuckle and I can see the clear skies and uh, hear the cows in the pasture <laughs> and all of those different things, you know, or Play-Doh, um, you know, smelling Play-Doh is something that might remind you of childhood. And there may be a lot of different things like that. Acoustic or auditory codes are, it can be, that can be uh, language. So a specific phrase or a specific voice that you remember or a specific song that you remember uh, from, uh, from childhood or from um, early on in your, in your life, or even more recently. Uh, visual codes, so remembering things from a, in a visual kind of way. And sometimes even that can be very um, uh, variable. Have you ever gone back to a place that the last time you visited it was as a child? And how did that place look different as an adult than it did as a child? Or did it look different? Like what was your experience of it? So I would definitely say like my elementary school like playground. So like a, like two years ago we went on like a bike ride and like rode past it. And it just, everything looked so much smaller. And as a kid, I remember everything looking like big and grown up. And then I drove by it and I was like, oh my God, everything's so small. Yeah, perfect example. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a, your cognitive map has changed, you know, and your perspective. When you're a young child and you're small and you have to look up to everybody, you know, things are a lot differently uh, or seem a lot different than they do when you're when you're an adult. Uh, semantic codes is where you where your body is in space and time, where you're sitting, where you're standing, uh, when a particular memory was encoded. Uh, what were you feeling like? What was your emotional state? You know, um, a lot of a lot of research has found is that the the higher our emotional state is during an event, the more likely we are to remember it. Why do you think that is? What would be your theory about that? Like just the fact that I've like grown up. Are you talking about emotional state like like anger and sadness? Because I think uh, the the stronger your emotional state is, the more presumably important whatever it's going on is, because it's affecting you that much. Yeah, absolutely, Kyle. That that is the that's the thought behind it, definitely, uh, or at least that's the theory behind it. And it makes sense in some ways, you know, evolutionarily. Uh, probably when we were at a heightened emotional state, that might have meant danger or something that we really needed to remember for our survival. And so we kind of went into overdrive, uh, remembering every detail of that particular part. So uh, then we get put into storage. Uh, again, you have that short term. Your short term and your uh, immediate memory are mediated through your brainstem, through your thalamus, your hypothalamus, your hippocampus, all or uh, components are part of uh, that storage section. 
There's one theory that not only are we storing memories in our central nervous system, which would be our brain and our spinal cord, but we might even be storing memories uh, encoded throughout our bodies. Um, I have uh, colleagues and friends who are massage therapists, and I've had a lot of massage therapists tell me that with some people, especially those who haven't gotten massages before, um, they'll hit a certain part of their body uh, on their on their client, and the person will start crying or laughing or having a, a memory like, gosh, I'm suddenly getting a flood of memories. When you touch me there, I remember blah, blah, blah happened. So, um, you know, storage and encoding can, can happen in a lot of different ways. So retrieval is a part of being recall, recalling something and then uh, recognizing it as well. Um, free recall is often more difficult than recognition recall. That's why uh, often, um, you know, multiple choice tests at least seem on their surface to be a little bit easier than uh, fill in the blank or essay questions where you have to recall things completely freely. So here's the basic memory processes you have encoding and that's putting the memory information into memory. If you use a computer as a analog for, for that, that's like typing in the information. And so different types of memory codes, here are three types, but as we said earlier, there are a lot more than this, but these are some of the main ones, acoustic, visual, semantic. Um, storage and maintain that memory, you have episodic, procedural, and semantic memory. We're gonna get into what, what those are and what kinds of memories those are about in a moment. And, uh, and then the retrieval uh, of those memories. So that's what we gotta do. It, there's a theory that we do actually probably store every single thing that we have ever experienced. It's just a matter of, of retrieving it. That's the, the difficult part. Uh, I am uh, cursed or blessed, depending on how you look at it, with a pretty good memory for, for dialogue and for um, events in my life. And I can remember almost without having even to look at notes for most of my clients, uh, pretty much what was said from from uh, session to session in, in therapy. That's a good trait to have if you're a, if you're a psychotherapist. Um, and some people have that ability and others may have uh, a great ability to recall numbers or mathematical concepts or mechanical procedural um, kinds of memory, how to do different things or the events that happen on a, on a certain day at a certain time. Uh, those are all different memory processes. Here's the three basic types of memory uh, that we'll get to in a, I think we get to that in a minute. I'll make sure we get to that. See, or otherwise I'll get into it now. I think we don't get into it. So, um, so the three basic types of memory, episodic memory is memory for, uh, for particular uh, events. Let me tell you the story about what happened last year on my birthday and we had a great party and this happened and that happened. That's an episodic memory. Semantic memory is, is memory for dates, facts, and figures. Um, in the year 1776, July the 4th, our the founding fathers of this nation got together and they signed the Declaration of Independence and sent it off to King George. Um, so that's kind of a combination of an episodic and a semantic memory, but it's a memory for facts and figures. And then procedural memory is memory about how to do particular things, how to ride a bicycle, uh, what a hammer is, and, and how to use that particular thing, how to follow a recipe and, uh, and make a, a particular dish are all examples of, of, procedur of procedural uh, memories. So you got explicit memory and implicit memory. Explicit memory are things that you can recall right off the top of your head without much of a, an effort to do so. Tell me your social security number. What is your date of birth? What is your mother's maiden name? Um, what was the name of your first school? <laughs> you know, these sound like uh, questions they ask you to 
recall your password if you can't get into a particular website. But uh, you know, those are all things that would be considered explicit in memory, memory that's easy to, to bring up and, and recall uh, without much effort. Implicit memory would be things that would, might be more difficult uh, to recall, and so you need some priming on it. Um, gosh, I remember a particular song. Um, Letting the days go by, let the water. Who was that by? Oh, let me think. Oh, and you scratch your head, you scratch your head over it. You go to Google, you put in the piece of the lyric that you can remember, and you hope that it brings it up. I know that might be an implicit memory, and so you might need something called priming in order to bring that particular thing up. Uh, oh, I remember your name. I remember who you are. It starts with a T. You are Tara or whatever, right? And so, you know, that's kind of an example of that. So different models of memory, you got levels of processing model. You have the maintenance and rehearsal part and the elaborative rehearsal part. Uh, one thing that we know in memory is uh, one of the ways that we uh, encode memories and are, actually, and are able to lay it down and remember things is through rehearsal. So the more you're able to, to do a particular skill, the more you're able to um, rehearse a certain fact and say it over and over in your mind, or the more you're able to take a fact and connect it with something like maybe a visual image or a song or something along those lines, it, uh, it might make it a little bit easier to remember. One good example for my generation, I'm Generation X, and uh, growing up in the 70s and 80s, we had this thing called Schoolhouse Rock that uh, I understand has had a resurgence on Netflix. I found it the other day, uh, and I kind of cracked up watching some of those old ones again. But um, they had a song on there that was the preamble to the Constitution. And we had to memorize the, the preamble of the Constitution. We had a test on it one time. And I watched that, uh, that episode a whole bunch of time. And it was like, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. And then it goes on and on and on. I remember every word because of the song. And um, that made it a lot, more, uh, a lot easier uh, to connect it. So sometimes having um, a song in there or creating a poem about it or a, mnemon a mnemonic device um, for a particular piece of information you're trying to remember uh, makes it a lot, a lot easier. Um, and then these are different models of memory that, we, that they get into in a, a moment or two, I hope. Otherwise, we'll come back to it again. So three stages of memory you have external stimuli. So the sensory memory, this is what I, I refer to as immediate memory. The sensory memory is the is memory that's briefly retained that you picked up by your all, all of your sensory organs. So right now, wherever you are, there may be things going on in your home or in your um, immediate awareness that you're kind of filtering out. So, you know, there may be a light on you and so you're kind of filtering out that light, or there may be the sound of air conditioner or people talking uh, outside of the room, different things like that, this constantly coming into your sensory awareness, but your conscious mind is filtering it out and you're not focusing on it. Um, it's astounding how that works. You can, you can notice how that works really well if you record audio record or even video record yourself uh, in a particular situation and then you go back and you look at the audio the video recording or you listen to the audio recording and you're concentrating on a conversation you're having with someone or you're concentrating on the particular event but the recording is not filtering anything out it's just giving you all the raw data as it's coming in. And so you're like, gosh, it was so noisy in that room. And look how bright it was. I can't believe it. Or look how dark it was. I don't remember it being that dark. So that's a good example of how we, we adapt to a, a certain situation. 
short-term memory holds information in our consciousness for about 18 seconds, not longer than that. Our long-term memory, um, if it finally gets over there, you uh, often will retain it for days, weeks, sometimes for the rest of your life, depending on what the memory is. So the role of long-term memory in understanding new information. This is a particular uh, bit from your book and from a particular study that talks a bit about that. I'll let you guys read that on your own later. All right, so storing the memories. What, I'm, what am I most likely to remember? As we said, sensory memory kind of comes and goes. You're only holding on to it for uh, a very brief amount of time. Uh, Short-term memory, in order to move it over to long-term, you have got to be able to uh, maintain it. Working memory is a form of short-term memory where you ask someone to listen to some data and then repeat the data back to you as they heard it or to manipulate the data and repeat it back to you in a different order. So like, here's a good example. I'm gonna give you six digits. These are six digits, six discrete numbers. I want you to listen to it and then give it to me backwards. Give it to me in reverse order. Nine, zero, four, five, four, seven. So if you haven't written it down, can you give it back to me in reverse? Not in reverse. <laughs> The longer the discrete uh, digits, the more difficult it is, of course. Uh, probably forwards, and a lot of times when I'm doing that particular kind of test, you know, most people can do two digits without any problem. In, in fact, even people who are severely demented, you can give them a two digit number, eight, seven, and they can easily give you seven, eight. Then you give them a three digit number, five, four, seven, and then they'll think for a second, and they'll, seven, four, five. But the longer the, the digit, the more effort it takes in your working memory to hold it. That's the maintenance component. And then to reverse it and give it back in a different way, that's the manipulation component of working memory. Is it 745409? I think so, yeah. Okay, sorry, just wanted to check. Yeah. You, you, I think you got it. Yeah, forward is it was 904 547, so 745 409. Yeah, you got it. So, encoding and short term memory is often but not always acoustic. You know, uh, some of the times in order for us to remember things, I know for me, whenever I write a paper, and I write a lot of, a lot of papers for, um, my practice, I'm constantly having to write evaluations. So um, often for me, what I have found that my mind plays a trick on me and it will actually project information onto the page is not really there if, if I do not give myself some sort of feedback. So I often will find myself going through and reading the paper word for word out loud like this so I can have some feedback. And whenever I read it out loud, then I realize, oh, geez, I used the wrong there, or I, uh, I didn't put a sentence in I thought I had put in, or I missed a word or a whole phrase I thought was there. Um, that's a, often a common, a common issue with, uh, with a lot of people. So these are the discrete digits. This is actually a, a psychological test that is given in the for the uh, intellectual examination called digit span. And what you do is you give each one of these numbers and you say them one second apart and you give them as discrete individual numbers, nine, two, five. You know, and you can imagine giving these numbers as discrete individual pieces, two, five, three, one, nine, seven, is a lot more difficult to remember then if you gave it to them like this, 
you know, and in fact, that's actually the same number of digits as a complete telephone number, isn't it? And, uh, and so that's why we chunk, it's called chunking our telephone number and the way we write it so it's easier to remember. You're actually not remembering nine discrete digits anymore. You're only remembering three chunks of information. So immediate memory span, uh, chunking is something that happens. Miller's magic number is a mnemonic device that's uh, sometimes used in uh, trying to increase our, our short-term memory or, or move it over to, to long-term memory. So here's a good example. Remembering this string of letters, F-B-I-A-O-L-M-T-V-Q-V-C-B-M-W. If you're trying to recall that string perfectly, it makes it more difficult than if you said it this way, FBI, AOL, MTV, QVC, BMW. Do y'all know what AOL is? <laughs> or is that? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're not that young. No, I, I don't am. know what AOL is. Oh, good. <laughs> Good. No I don't know what AOL is, but I just know a bunch of random information that no one actually There's a meme cares about. about the noise so let's that go. AOL makes. I remember that. You've got mail. You remember that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, some of uh, some of the references on some of these slides, I I, I don't remember. I don't know if uh, if they're way out of date or outside of your uh, your cultural uh, milieu for some of my students, depending on on where they are. All right, so um, obviously, even if you didn't have a connection to any of these things, as you know, remembering the brand or what they are, uh, even just chunking them in this way might be a little bit easier. But certainly, because you have a connection to it, then it's a lot easier to remember. So again, chunks is just putting together meaningful grouping of information. So it helps to improve your short-term memory. So this is forgetting in short-term memory. This is the percentage of items recalled and the number of seconds between giving the information and then recalling it. So no, you're not, you don't have dementia. You're pretty normal if you can't remember it 18 seconds later. Uh, we all have to write those things down uh, or giving ourselves a, a reminder. Uh, Suri, remind me to, uh, Pick up the dry cleaning tomorrow at five o'clock. Okay. So long-term memory and coding usually involve semantic coding. That's uh, language coding. Uh, storage capacity may be unlimited as we don't really know what the upper limit is of our, of our brain capacity. But memories are prone to distortion as we had uh, talked about earlier. There was uh, one really fascinating a study that was done with, with young children where um, a, a teacher came in and she had a big box. It was a very tall box and it came all the way up to the teacher's nose and uh, it was like a big refrigerator type box. And I uh, didn't have any writing or anything on it and it was all painted one single color. But she brought it in and she looked over into the box and um, there were all these preschool children in there in the room and she looked in the box and she goes, oh, there's a fox. There's a fox in this box. Oh, he is an amazing fox. He's a red fox with a white, with a white stripe on his tail. He's a beautiful fox. There's a fox in this box. And then she asked for volunteers. How many of you children want to see the fox in the box? And each child would come up. And she would pick the child up and the child would look over into the box and she says, you see the fox? And you know, no, there's nothing in there. And there wasn't, there was nothing in there, nothing in the box. And some children begin thinking, well, maybe this is an imagination exercise or maybe I should say it's a fox in a box. Or they weren't really sure what to do. But some kids said, yeah, there's a fox. I can see them. And they kind of made up the story. And some says, no, there's no fox. Well, a month later, um, they came back and they brought the box back. And the teacher asked, told the students about, do you remember when I brought the box in and we talked about the fox in the box? 
And the kids, yes, all, every single kid remembered the event. Then she asked the kids a very interesting question. She said, how many of you think there was a real fox in the box and you really do remember the real fox? How many of you remember there being a real fox in the box? Over half the children raised their hand and absolutely uh, emphatically believed that there had been a real fox in the box, even though the box was completely empty. So one thing that uh, they surmised about this particular study is that especially in young children, um, and the younger the child, the easier it is to influence their, their memory, that it's, it's particularly easy to uh, introduce a false memory. Um, and the more people who agree that the false memory actually occurred in reality, the more likely people are to, to, re to remember it. They've even done studies uh, that we'll get to in some slides later on about um, introducing false memories, even in adults. So uh, we all have to uh, trust but verify uh, our memories in some ways. So encoding into long-term memory. So what do you think? Without looking at a penny, which one is correct? Which penny is, is actually the layout of penny as you recall it being? Is it A through E? Which one is it? I mean, I'm going to go with A. Um, yeah. Just because, like, I think it has In God We Trust, and I'm pretty sure it has the date. Okay. Uh, and you know what? Liberty just kind of, sure, that sounds right. <laughs> okay. Anybody want to think, want to argue with that or say differently? I'm going to go, go, oh, yeah. I'm going to go with D. You're gonna go with D. Yeah, it looks right. I don't. I, I don't know if the penny has liberty on it. Does anyone have a penny? Where? I do. Someone want to verify which one? It's, it's you a. You know what? Did you? Okay, before you answer, did you manipulate us by putting liberty on all four options except for one? <laughs> no. It's uh, out of the book. <laughs> Yeah, graphic. Yeah, interesting though, huh? I mean, even something that's so common that we have seen, gosh, how many times have you seen a penny? Hundreds of thousands of times maybe, depending on how long you've been around. But, you know, it's an object you kind of begin to take for granted and you, but then when you are introduced to different variations, you're like, well, which one, which one is it? You know, there's that inkling of a doubt at, at times and it, it makes it uh, makes you realize that you're how easy it is to manipulate uh, your memory. So distinguishing distinguishing between short term and long term memory, you have the primacy effect, which is a characteristic of memory, in which recall is particularly good for the first two or three items on a long list. So if I were to give you a list of um, uh, of words, for example. Um, I'm going to give you five words, and I want you to listen to these, uh, and then uh, try to remember them. I'm going to ask you for them later. Uh, apple, pin, tie, house, car. Uh, and the longer the list, the more often, the more likely people are to remember uh, just the beginning of the list and just the end of the list, and the middle begins to go away. A uh, recency effect is the characteristic of memory in which recalls particularly good for the last few items on, on the list. So it, and a lot of times it depends on where your attention is, uh, where your attention is being focused to. Uh, if you can't concentrate and attend to a stimuli uh, or attend to something that the teacher is saying or the book is, is trying to tell you when you're reading it, where a video or an audio is trying to, to let you know, the more difficult it is to, uh, to encode it to begin with. Uh, that's why kids with and adults with uh, attention deficit disorder have a difficult time with learning sometimes. It's not that they don't have the capacity to learn, it's that because their attention is constantly shifting, it makes it more difficult to encode new memories. 
So here's another recall experiment. You know, look at all, look at these words. We have desk, frame, carburetor, flag, grill, book, urn, candle, briefcase, screen, tree, soup, ocean, castle, monster, bridge. So in class, often I ask people to write down as many of those words as they can in any order. But um, without referring back to the slide, how many of those can you remember? Can any of you remember the five words that I gave you two or three slides back? Apple pen tie house car. Oh, Elizabeth has got an excellent, excellent short term, uh, long term memory. Very good. So it's a serial position curve. Again, this is the primacy effect, the recency effect on the long list of words that I gave you er um, earlier. Again, often the middle words uh, are discounted if you're not really paying attention or it's more difficult uh, to recall those. So how do I retrieve my stored memories? One way is having a retrieval queue. So encoding uh, the encoding specificity uh, or specific principle, specificity, um, it depends on the state sometimes or um, the moment uh, of where you're trying to remember something, the specific information you're trying uh, to encode and how it's related to other information that you've learned uh, earlier uh, can can make a big difference in that. Uh, smells are particularly effective retrieval cues. Um, context specific memories. Sometimes we remember things because, you know, we were with a specific group of friends or we were in a certain place. Um, or we, or we learned the information in a particular classroom and then we take the test in the same classroom. Sometimes it's easier to remember the information. Uh, state dependent memory, and that's the effect of mood congruency. Uh, if you were uh, highly emotional, you were crying and upset when you learned a particular th uh, thing, uh, you actually, believe it or not, might be able to remember it more clearly if you're in a similar mood. Uh, and that also can, um, be a big part of that uh, or make a, uh, or, or be just as true for positive emotions. Uh, so, you know, being very happy and being very joyous when you learned a particular thing. So semantic memory, how to reach information from semantic memory. One is that we have this thing called the principle of spreading activation or, or memory networks where, you know, like for example, the, the example I gave earlier, trying to remember a particular song and who sang that particular song. Um, the song that I was referring to is by, was by the Talking Heads, one of my favorite bands from the late 70s and, and, uh, and 80s. Um, and so if you were trying to remember that particular band, then uh, you may begin naming other bands. Okay, well... Uh, Right, it was an '80s band. Uh, uh, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't R.E.O. Speedwagon. It wasn't Hollow Notes. It wasn't. You know who was it? I think it was an indie rock band. Uh, okay, what other indie rock bands are there? Was it Love and Rockets? Was it Cure? No, it wasn't them. Uh, oh, it was Talking Heads. And so all of those different discrete pieces of information are interconnected with one another, and you begin naming those different things, and it helps you to finally find. Uh, where that particular one particular piece is. Once you find that particular piece of information, then you have an emotional feedback that tells you the information you have you have found is probably correct. That's how we also know whether or not a memory that we have is an actual memory that we experienced is often because 
Yes. There is an emotional component that goes along with it that makes it feel true. It rings true to us. Um, and that's how we know it, it was that it was that something we really experienced and not a movie we saw or something else along those lines. Uh, retrieving incomplete knowledge, that's the tip of the tongue phenomena, trying to figure out uh, what that exactly is. Um, so here is the semantic memory network and how it's believed to be uh, encoded in some ways, uh, or at least how our mind organizes it. So if we're trying to remember a very particular thing, we're trying to, we know that that object we see, this creature we see is a bird, but what kind of bird is it? And what is a bird? We know, you know, you think about a bird as an animal, it's a living thing, uh, but so is a plant, but we know it's not a plant. Is it a mammal? No, a bird is its own thing. It's a cat, it's a lion, it's a bat. All of these th different things are interrelated to one another. And it's a form of a language or a semantic uh, memory network. And that's why often uh, that tip of the tongue phenomena, as we're trying to remember a particular um, name of something, uh, we begin naming everything that, around it and related to it and it helps to activate that network and we finally get to what we're trying to figure out. So constructing memories, how accurate are our memories? I kind of uh, gave that to you already uh, in some ways, but um, has, have you ever had the experience where um, you remembered a particular event and then someone contradicted your memory of it? Anyone have an example of that? I don't have any specific examples, but like my memory is just trash in general. So whenever someone's like, oh yeah, I totally did this thing with you. I'm like, oh yeah, I probably did. It's hard to remember this stuff. Okay. So if it wasn't particularly, um, I guess, uh, relevant to you or uh, even things that, you, that people say that they did with you, uh, can be sometimes difficult to recall. All right, so here's a form of kind of constructive memory. You know, you think about, you see a an office like this, or maybe it's a dorm room, or maybe it's a storage room, or this is, you know, what are the objects in here? And where are they located? Um, some people will actually construct their memory in a way where they will have a blank room or they'll have a room that's familiar to them, like maybe their childhood bedroom. And if they have to remember something, they will visually in their mind put a particular object that remembers that represents the thing they're trying to remember into the room of their mind. Then they can go back to it, find that object and recall what they were trying to remember. Uh, that's a kind of a visual uh, reconstructive memory uh, device or way to, to do it. So here is a research question. I could swear I heard it. The researcher's question was, how easy is it for people to form false memories? Uh, students heard different lists of words that were related to a particular theme, but the theme word was never included. Would students remember hearing the theme word? What the researchers found was that students falsely but confidently recognized the theme words from 12 of the 16 lists, even though the themes were falsely recognized as often as listed words were correctly recognized. So, you know, they kind of give them a, a semantic network of words that talked around a particular uh, theme. And because it probably activated their own semantic network, they uh, were certain that they did remember hearing the particular word that was the theme. So particip participants could not uh, always distinguish words they had heard from those that 
that I had not heard and participants' knowledge of words that should have been on the list created a memory that they were present. Excuse me. And so that's a, uh, that's a good example of a false memory. So I kind of gave this away with talking about a little bit of the um, semantic memory networks and how that sometimes gets, uh, gets created. So parallel uh, distributed processing models of memory might be one possible explanation for constructive memory. Um, the parallel distributed processing model networks can produce spontaneous generalizations. And this can be helpful, but it can also lead to uh, significant errors in people's memories. And it might explain the role of schemas in constructive memories. In other words, um, a schema is a kind of a collection of um, memories that form the basis for understanding a particular concept. So like, for example, you have a schema for chair and it doesn't matter what chair you see now because you have developed that schema. You can see a, a, a royal throne that's big and giant and, and ornate. You can see a little tiny office chair. You can see a child's chair. You can see uh, a chair that's a lounge chair beside a pool. You can see a folding chair. You can see all kinds of different chairs. And it doesn't matter. And even though those chairs are different shapes, different colors, different sizes, because they all fit into the schema of chair in your mind, uh, you have the ability to recognize different objects as, as chairs without having to relearn that what is this thing? right? You just, well, it's a chair. I know what it is. And uh, you have schemas for all kinds of different uh, concepts in, in, that, uh, in that context. So here's the role of schemas in recall. So here's a figure shown to participants and then it was given different labels. The cause of the label it was given when the participants were asked to draw it, it had a completely different result later on. This is kind of fascinating, isn't it? Because it really shows how much, how we label different concepts, how we change even our conception and our memory of those concepts by the label uh, it's given. You know, you think about this in terms of human beings um, you know, often someone might ask you, uh, you know, tell me about yourself. Well, there's a lot of different ways you can describe yourself. So like, you know, for example, what if I were to tell you that I'm a native American Democrat, uh, I favor a socialist, uh, economic kind of a world, uh, worldview or, or system. Uh, and I am uh, a staunch advocate for um, social justice. All right, so all of those different labels and all of those different words that it has told you brought up dozens of different kinds of ideas of what, who I might be, how I might react, and how you should react to me. Or I could say, um, uh, I'm a white male, um, you know, cisgender male, uh, heterosexual Republican and staunch Trump supporter. <laughs> now you got a whole different concept of what that might mean and, uh, and how, you know, how you should react to me from in that perspective. And so this is a really important concept that we have to uh, understand and how labels in and of themselves limit our perception, not only of objects and concepts, but of each other as well. And um, often what I have found is that uh, people are, are far greater than the sum of whatever labels you decide to put them on, put on them, or even the labels they put on themselves. So um, we have to expand our mind uh, beyond that. 
All right, so uh, how accurate are eyewitness memories? Um, although compelling often, uh, a lot of the forensic, um, even the forensic cases that I do, and certainly the forensic research has shown that eyewitnesses uh, make a lot of mistakes. One of the things I'm asked to do as a forensic psychologist is sometimes I'm asked to do uh, really even a bit of investigative work. So uh, on occasion, I'll get hired by a defense attorney to determine whether or not a person was insane at the time of a particular crime. Insane is actually a, um, a legal term, not a psychological term. And what it means what is that you did not have the capacity to determine right from wrong and you did not know what you were doing and or you did not know what you were doing at the time of, of a particular uh, crime uh, was committed. And so in order to figure that out, number one, what you have to understand as the forensic psychologist is that that concept is embedded in a moment of time that doesn't change. So we're just looking at that moment in time when the person allegedly committed the crime. So then you have to go back and you have to kind of reconstruct you know, what is the evidence for this person's um, state of mind? Uh, what do you think? So if you, if you had to imagine uh, this was your job, what would be the, one of the first things you would want to look for? What piece of information would you want and what kind of questions would you ask and who would you want to talk to if you were trying to determine a person's state of mind and whether or not they were insane at the time of a, of a crime was committed? What would you want to know? I would maybe talk to first like the people that are closest to whoever was involved, like whether they live with them or somebody that they interact with on a regular basis, just to see how everybody's, uh, I guess everybody's perception of their state of mind is and see if they all add up to the same story. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Yeah, that's, that's uh, right on. Yeah, that's one of the first things you certainly wanna do. Uh, you wanna figure out who was there at the time and who knows this person, right, the defendant, and uh, what collateral information interviews can you do uh, for this person? So that, so, you know, it may be the spouse, it might be family members, it might be friends, it might be neighbors, it might be a lot of different people. What, uh, what other pieces of information do you think you would want to collect to determine a person's state of mind at a given piece of time? Who, who else might be important to talk to or who else might be important to get their information? Any more guesses? You guys haven't seen a lot of cop shows. <laughs> um, well, one of the most important pieces of information that is often given to me right off the bat is the report report from the police officer who is the arresting officer. Um, some of the time, the police officer goes into great detail about the person's state of mind, what they were saying at the time, uh, whether or not they seemed like they were in their right mind, and what even the context was for the police officer to come and interview the person or come to arrest the person to begin with. You know, all of that is information that you want to kind of put into there. Uh, I always try to interview the defendant themselves, you know, get what their story was, what they remember, what they don't remember. Uh, piece that together with any other eyewitnesses that it might have been around during that moment of time. Then I want to look at a, their medical records and their mental health records. Had they ever been confined to a psychiatric hospital? And if they have, um, you know, what was her state of mind during those periods of time? Does this person have a history of severe mental illness? Uh, does this person have a, uh, a neurological issue? Did they have a traumatic head injury? Did they have a stroke? Did they have, you know, 
there's you want to get all the information you can to put together to try to figure out exactly what was going on. Um, were they sleep deprived? You know, a lot of different questions that you could uh, think about or come up with to try to piece it together. And that, in a lot of ways, that's kind of coming up with uh, understanding, you know, that, that, that kernel of truth. Uh, the more resources you have regarding the person's state of mind at the time of the event, the more evidence you have, the more certain your conclusions can be. Uh, sometimes I will have uh, lawyers who will give me a particular case and there's just no evidence for it. And, you know, I'll just write in my report, you know, at this time, there's no evidence to conclude that this person was insane at the time of the event. Uh, however, as evidence becomes available, you know, I might write an addendum to my report. Um, the misinformation effect is uh, one of the, one of those things that happen as well. When people are highly emotional, they are prone to um, having their memory manipulated in some ways or even having misinformation uh, introduced into their uh, eyewitness or their thoughts. Um, and that's certainly something important to think about if you're a police officer. So um, here's an example of a, of a car crash. So how fast were the cars going when they hit each other? They smashed into, people estimated it being much faster than it actually was, hit or contacted. Contacted is a much less, um, uh, much less strong verb, I guess you could say, than smashed into. So here's the original information. And then how fast were they going when they smashed into each other? Their memory for smashed into made it look like a much worse accident than what it actually than what it actually was. So even little things like that, the language that we use influences uh, our memories as well. So the believability of testimony is often influenced by how the witness presents the evidence. Jurors tend to believe witnesses confident about their testimony. This is a big part uh, of sometimes what psychologists do who are, are on the defense team. Uh, sometimes there are some psychologists who actually do what's called uh, witness preparation. Uh, you're not testifying as an expert witness uh, in a particular case, you are just trying to prepare a witness to come across as believable. So, um, you know, when some, someone is like, you know, kind of looking off in the direction and they're touching their face a lot. And when they're trying to remember something like, uh, you know, I guess such and such happened, you know, it seems very uncertain and a lot less believable than if they touch their chest. And let me tell you, I remember this particular event exactly. And this is exactly what happened. And that level of confidence um, often will influence the jury to believe the, the witness a lot stronger than if they come across as uh, someone who's a little uncertain of themselves. So weakness of I want this testimony can be amplified by the use of police lineups one of the things that's important uh, that the police uh, have been taught to say, uh, but sometimes don't, is that uh, they have an eyewitness and they take them in, into a room and there's a lineup. And so uh, you've probably seen this in, in different um, shows, but there's a line of individuals and they try to do their best to get the people to look about the same. So if they're all six foot tall white guys with receding hairlines and brown eyes like me, you want to, you know, and, and that is who allegedly committed the crime. You want to have people who look similar so that the level of certainty uh, can be a little bit stronger when they, when they pick someone out of, of the lineup. But you also want to tell the eyewitness that the person who actually committed the crime may not be in the lineup. That's a really important piece of information to tell them. Uh, that way they don't feel compelled uh, to make a forced choice.
because they think, well, someone is uh, in there. Um, so published guide may uh, help reduce the potential for errors and eyewitness evidence. And that's basically using a standardized format for uh, uh, presenting uh, police lineups. All right, so what causes us to forget things? Uh, Ebbing Haas was a researcher who used himself in a semantic study or a systematic study of memory and forgetting. He devised the relearning memory and saving. Uh, the two lasting discovery of Ebbinghaus's research is the shape of the forgetting curve and how long lasting savings in long term memory can be, and a concept known as hyperamnesia. Uh, so here is Ebbinghaus's curve of forgetting. So between one hour, here's the mean retention of information. So within 20 minutes, 20 minutes remembered almost 100% of the information, but after an hour had lost over 50% of it. But then there's kind of almost a plateau that occurs going off and it continues to plateau. So what would this tell you about how we encode information, how we remember things? Like given what we've learned so far, how would you explain this curve? Anybody want to take a guess? I mean, we're constantly like learning things and uh, I guess observing new things. So it could get buried, but it's still there. So uh, there might be an interference effect in some ways. Yeah, we're, you know, we're learning, being exposed to new things, learning new things, and so that's interfering with our ability in some ways. Yeah, that's a uh, interesting and uh, um, certainly a big part of uh, a a good part of the um, the puzzle. Uh, decay theory is that um, our memories just aren't don't hold there like digital information. Um, the semantic networks decay if we're not rehearsing it constantly. There's no need to remember a particular piece of information. Uh, our brain or our, our mind might just shuttle it off into some dark corner and uh, we're not having to uh, uh, recall it. Um, uh, what David had said uh, just a moment ago about interference is uh, a big part of it. Certainly, we have retroactive inhibition and proactive uh, inhibition as well. So here's a good example of proactive interference. You have an experiment. You have to learn a list, list A, then you learn list B, then you try to recall list B. So the experimental group will suffer from proactive interference and the control group will be able to recall more material from list B because the experimental group learned list A first, then tried to learn list B, then tried to recall only list B. That's proactive interference. Retroactive interference is just the opposite. Now we're trying to recall list A. That was the very first list that was learned. The experimental group will suffer from retroactive interference and the control group will be able to recall more material from uh, list A. So that's kind of the difference between uh, how interference works sometimes to uh, mess with our memory. So here's retrieval fa failures and forgetting. The recall when given an item, categories or retrieval cues. This is a percentage of words recalled, the number of intervening lists, and then the initial recall when asked for. So, and sometimes you can have both. Sometimes you can have both retroactive and proactive um, interference uh, in memory. All right, so here is an example of can traumatic memories be repressed then recovered? Can all memory of shocking events be repressed? So is there evidence to support the claim? Much mental activity occurs outside of awareness. We know that for a fact. Our old pal Freud talked about that. 
over 100 years ago, but even our studies in neuroscience have uh, backed that up. Behavior can be influenced by information of which we are not 100% aware. So research on motivated forgetting suggests that we can willfully suppress information. I don't want to think about that. Don't even talk about it. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to recall it. I don't want to have anything to do with it. I'm just going to ignore it. I'm going to shift my attention over here and focus on something different. But that's very different from repression. That's more like suppression. You are consciously trying to not recall something and let it go. So retrieval cues may aid recall memories inaccessible to conscious awareness. That certainly uh, can be the case. People are very confident in the accuracy of their recovered memories. But again, even in adults, we know that uh, memories can be man manipulated and people can create uh, false memories. So any given recovered memory may actually be restored, distorted or a constructed memory. False memories can be just as vivid as real as accurate memories. People can be just as confident in false memories as in true memories. Um, a lot of research has shown that if you are susceptible to a phenomenon known as disassociation, um, which is basically what happens to you in hypnosis, then uh, sometimes false memories are easier uh, to be created. Um, but, uh, you know, we also have to take this with, uh, with a grain of salt in and of itself. So is it possible for people to repress the memories of traumatic events? Um, sometimes it is, but for the most part, uh, people don't suppress things or repress things wholly. Um, we have to be kind of skeptical of some of that part. Recovery of traumatic memories is possible, but the implantation of false memories is also possible. That's why as a therapist, you have to be very, very careful that you do not introduce a suggestion to a person that a feeling that they have or a certain uh, phenomena that's occurring to them might be the result of a false memory because you can, you can help to create a, a false memory if you do that. Uh, the client's report uh, provides stronger proof of recovery memories than the results of laboratory experiments. Um, and then there's reported claims of recovery memories. They should not all be automatically rejected. You know, again, it's kind of a trust but verify uh, kind of phenomena about that. Uh, if a client comes to me with a particular memory uh, that they think that they have recovered, I don't automatically say, well, you know, uh, recovered memories are often false and blah, 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 you know, because that's very discounting uh, of a person's experience, particularly if they're very emotional about, about it or if they've been almost traumatized or seem to be traumatized by it. Now, what would you do in this particular um, scenario? So here, this is a client I had several years ago. And um, this client was a very respected businessman in the community. Um, he came in, no history of mental illness at all. And uh, no history of traumatic head injury, no history of a brain injury, no history of any kind of disease or disorder that would have affected his brain or his memory situation high functioning individual. He came in and he reported and all the testing I gave him and in his initial uh, interview, he reported almost all the symptoms that you would need to have to be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And so whenever someone uh, presents with post-traumatic stress disorder, um, one of the first things you want to try to figure out is what is the root of the trauma? Where, where did this reaction, this post-traumatic stress come from? What is the trauma that it's based upon? He said that he had been abducted by aliens and he had a very vivid memory um, from the point of initial paralysis to the to being the abduction, what the aliens looked like, what they did to him, 
and how they returned him back to his uh, home, on and on and on. I mean, an incredibly detailed story. And so he wanted to um, get therapy for this particular trauma. You're the psychologist in this particular case. What would you have done? Given the information I just gave you about this person, how would you have handled it? Obviously, the first step is to contact Area 51. <laughs> Maybe, right? To see if they uh, have any missing alien ships over there. Mm -hmm. I, I would say start looking into like, what commonalities that people who have reported alien abductions have, like just the commonalities between their behaviors and so on. So you would you would take it at face value, and, and then you would do some ex, some research into the commonalities of, of people who had a, who had reported similar experiences. So not at like face value, but yeah, at like what what actually happened instead of like them being uh, abducted, which didn't happen, but like was it like? sleep paralysis or something like that. Okay, so you, you would look at also differential diagnosis. What what else could it have been other than that? Anyone else? How else would you have handled that if you were the psychologist or the therapist in this particular case? Um, pretty much I handled it, uh, honestly, like I would have handled any other tra traumatic event. From my perspective as the treating therapist, I didn't feel like it was my, uh, duty necessarily to, um, determine whether this was true or false. One thing I did know is that he wasn't psychotic. Uh, at least not at the, at the time that I saw him. Uh, he did have the symptoms that he reported. So I just treated it like I would any other trauma. And um, we did, you know, psychotherapy and kind of processed the trauma and um, he kind of moved through it. And we did about a year's worth of, of therapy together and then he just kind of moved on with his life. Um, and so sometimes the the memory itself may not have, may not be the most important thing because my job as a psychologist is mostly to help a person return to functioning. I want to help a person get over their emotional trauma, get over um, the blocks that are impeding their day-to-day -day life and return them to, to functioning, whatever that might, might look like for them. But it's an interesting case. One thing I love about being a psychologist is never a boring day. All right, so what are the biological bases of memory? Um, now we know uh, on some level, uh, we can even see it happening on a scanning electron uh, microscope that uh, we believe that synapses grow new dendritic connections to one another. And this is the thought that these synaptic um, circuits are one of the primary ways that memory is encoded uh, throughout our nervous system, whether it's in our central nervous system or our peripheral nervous system. And our peripheral nervous system, as we learned earlier, is the um, part of our nervous system that's outside of our brain and our spinal cord. Uh, so new experiences change the orientation of existing synapses. You have long-term potentiation that occurs and then long-term uh, depression that occurs in, uh, in other synapses that help to lay down the memory in a, a biochemical kind of way. You have synaptic changes that occur in the hippocampus. The hippocampus is um, a part of our brain and our lower brain stem that's believed to help shuttle um, the short-term memories and the long-term memories. And these synapses use glutamate, which is a particular 
uh, neurochemical needed for um, uh, or is to help with memory formation along with acetylcholine uh, who, that also may be important for a memory formation. We know that people with specific dementias like Alzheimer's are deficient in acetylcholine, for example. So here's what it looks like on a scanning electron mi microscope and how the dendrites actually are growing into one another. So brain structures involved in memory, we have our cerebral cortex. That's basically the larger upper part of our brain and includes the, our four main um, lobes of our brain, the frontal, occipital, temporal, and, and uh, parietal lobes. And then uh, the thalamus and the hippocampus, and even the cerebellum. Uh, the cerebellum helps to encode memories like uh, your procedural memories, uh, riding a bicycle, knowing how to use a screwdriver. That's all kind of encoded in your, in your cerebellum, as well as encoded in circuits throughout the brain. So, you know, you may have a circuit that links your cerebellum to your occipital visual cortex. So you see a particular item, you recognize what it is, you retrieve the word for that particular item from your temporal lobe, um, and then you know how to use that particular item, you know, that, it, it, that's, a, that's a circuit. It's not included in one particular area. It is the product of the brain as a whole acting together in concert to uh, render that particular behavior. So how do brain injuries affect memory? You have uh, anterior grade amnesia, that's a loss of memory for an event occurring after the injury. So that's the ability to basically encode new memories. Retrograde amnesia is a loss of memory for events occurring before the injury. Um, you know, if you've ever seen a, a soap opera where someone has amnesia, they're talking about retrograde amnesia. You know, they get hit in the head. Oh, who am I? You know, I don't remember who I am. I don't remember where I grew up. Uh, I don't remember anything about me help me figure this out. You know, that's the soap opera uh, amnesia in some ways. So the hippocampus does not permanently store long-term memories. Those are probably stored in your cerebral cortex. Long-term semantic and episodic memories are probably stored uh, in your cerebral cortex. Your memories are both localized and distributed. In different areas of the brain become active during memory retrieval. So how do we improve the memory? You guys are, are chatting here. Oh, goodbye, per, goodbye, I'll see you later if you have to go to a meeting. All right, so how can I remember more information? One is mnemonics strategies involving putting information into an organized framework. So a verbal organi uh, organization is the most common. Um, you know, one of the ways that I remember how many days are in each month is a poem I learned back in elementary school. 30 days hath November, April, June, and September. All the rest have 31 except February, which has 28, except leap year, 29. It's a terrible poem, but uh, I memorized it and I haven't forgotten it. And so <laughs> I remember, uh, that's how I remember what, how many days each month has. The uh, memory of loci is a simple but powerful mnemonic, basically putting um, your uh, semantic information uh, into a particular uh, visual medium in your mind. Uh, first, create an outline or overall context of learning. Here's a guide for studying. Don't just passively read and reread the material. Repetition alone tends to be ineffective. You know, you want to put it into context and try to figure out uh, what it is, what it's really all about. Why do I have to learn trigonometry? What is trigonometry used for? Do any of you know? Trigonometry or calculus? It's, it's, like, it's like math stuff. So you, you use it when you need math. 
It is math. But do you know what it's used for in the real world? It's got a lot of applications in physics. Yeah. So, so it, you know, sometimes creating, that's what word problems are supposed to do for you. Um, creating word problems or putting a, a specific skill that you learn like the trigonometry formulas into real world applications might make it more easy to learn and understand than just here's a formula, here's how to solve it. And it's just kind of out of context. Uh, distributed practice is more effective than mass practice for learning and retaining information. What that means is learning in an hour to 90 minute cycles. So, you know, reading a chapter, going over the notes, listening to it, and then stop. Take a break, get a muffin or talk to a friend, go back to it, and then read again. Because your, you know, your brain and your mind need time to encode the new information. It needs time to assimilate it, to kind of figure out what's going on there. And then uh, practice retrieving uh, what you've learned. All of that can be uh, very helpful. So reading a textbook, make sure you understand what you're reading before you move on and be an active learner in it. Lecture notes. Um, gosh, I've known people who took very complex lecture notes, uh, color coded it with highlighters, connected it to concepts inside of a chapter. Um, that is some hardcore lecture note taking. What I found with me personally, because I'm such an auditory learner, is that if I can hear what is being said, I tend to remember it much, much better than I do when I'm trying to write it down and see something uh, just in a written format. And everyone tends to be able to recall information a little bit differently, uh, depending on kind of how you are, are oriented. All right. Are there any questions or concerns or comments about tonight's lecture? I'm going to remember Apple Pen tie house car for the rest of the night, maybe multiple days. Excellent, because that, that is actually on uh, a mini mental status exam called the slums test, the St. Louis University uh, mental status test that's uh, often given to people uh, over the age of 65 to determine uh, what their current cognitive abilities are. I had to do something like that. Mm -hmm. Is there anything like special? For analysis or whatever. Yeah, is there anything special about like Apple pen, uh, tie, house car? They're all objects that are in the real world. So not only do you can you remember the name, but you may have a visual association with what each one of those things look like. So that's part of it. They're concrete objects. And so um, you're, you are asking the person to remember uh, a set of things that are, that are all uh, concrete objects. So I'm not asking you to, rem to rem remember, you know, patriotism, love, apple, car, you know, humanity. You know, gotcha, those, are, gotcha. those are all, you know, some of those are abstract. Some of those are concrete and trying to remember those might be more difficult than remembering just a set of objects. That's one of the reasons why they're, uh, they're that. Any other questions? Well, I sure did enjoy tonight's lecture as always. Uh, That's all I got for the, tonight. Y'all have a great evening and I will see okay. you next week. Thanks, Professor. Thanks, have Professor. Nice Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thanks. Take care.